In our last episode, we defended the ghouls of Gravestone, who built their town in the ruins of Kansas City from an onslaught by the super mutants. In so doing, the Brotherhood recovered an intact nuclear warhead. And after our success, we headed back to Bunker Gamma. Upon arrival, we can inspect the Quartermaster. He now has the Avenger minigun for sale, but after testing it in the last mission, I'm not too keen on it. Think I'll stick with the Brownings. He has a number of laser pistols for sale now, and he now carries at least one Rocket Sabo. I did my best to sell as much as I could and store the rest. In the last mission, I walked away, leaving a lot of loot behind, so I took only what I needed. I gave Alice and Max the Brownings and the missile launchers, though I'm a bit disappointed with the missile launchers. Both Alice and Max have been missing a lot with them, despite having really high big guns. I kept my ghouls with their sniper rifles and gave them each a shotgun. I gave the Pankar jackhammer to Babs, since it, strangely enough, had a lower strength requirement compared to the other shotguns. Gave Harold the HNK cause and Daryl the Neostat shotgun. I still haven't figured out why Harold is glowing white. I read some of the troubleshooting suggestions in the comments from the last episode. I tried removing his armor, putting on different pieces of armor. I put him back into the recruits pool and tried spinning around his portrait. Nothing seems to have helped. So he's just glowing white for now. We don't find any new recruits available. And so when ready to go, we can head back to General Decker to learn about our next mission. Osceola, Missouri. Be at ease, warrior. We have a confirmation on the whereabouts of the super mutant leader. As you're probably well aware, he calls himself Gamoran. We have recently linked him to the late Paladin Latham, one of the finest warriors present on the Great Air Convoy. He was believed dead, but after all these years, he has resurfaced under a different identity and a much different purpose. This revelation explains how the super mutants were able to counter our battle tactics and reconnaissance efforts, as Paladin Latham wrote many of the procedures that we use today. At first, we believed the mutants had successfully interrogated General Barnaby, but records prove that our methods were compromised before the general fell into enemy hands. Even now, many of the elders are having trouble coming to terms with the fact that he has betrayed us and turned against the order, but the truth must not be denied. You have two objectives for this mission. Your first objective is to assassinate Gamoran. He is a dangerous man, and his knowledge of our inner workings could prove our undoing. Without his guidance, the super mutants will lack the leadership and discipline to be a continual threat. Your second objective is to recover General Barnaby. All facts indicate that he will be kept close to Gamoran. Assemble your squad immediately. Dismiss. So wait, the super mutant leader Gamoran is actually a former Brotherhood of Steel paladin named Latham? Is Latham still human or is he now a super mutant? If he's a mutant, how was he exposed to FEV? If he isn't a mutant, how did he survive the Zeppelin crashing? And how is he alive after all of these years? And why would he choose to work with super mutants? I now have so many questions. To learn more, we have to hop into the Hummer and head to the world map. We find Osceola southwest of Bunker Gamma, far past Jefferson, but not quite as west as Kansas City. Upon arrival, the first thing we can do is look at the map. We arrive in the southwestern corner. This is our insertion point and our extraction point after successful completion of the mission. Northeast of us, we learn that there is a building here which appears to be the meeting point for the change of the guard. East of this, intelligence reports that this area is watched constantly by roving patrols. Northwest, we learn that scouts have marked this area as heavily saturated by enemy patrols. To the far south, we find that there is an entrance to an underground tunnel. And then in the middle of the map, against the southern wall of this complex, we find a southern entrance into the military compound. We expect it to be heavily guarded. Then in the western wall, we find another entrance equally guarded. But due north of this, we learn that there is an opening here that allows access to the underground tunnels beneath the military compound. This is inside the wall. We'll have to get in before we can go underneath. East of here, we find another opening that allows us into the underground tunnels beneath the military complex. So two ways underground. To the northeast, we'll learn that a watchtower has been built here. The Brotherhood has noted sniper activity from this tower covering the eastern perimeter. 
Then, on the northern side of the wall, we discover a back entrance to the military compound as it faces the cliffs to the north and the northeast. But due north of this, and blocking the entrance, we discover that it's mined outside. Avoid or neutralize the minefield in this area. West of this, we learn that the wreckage of a dirigible is here. It is believed to be the remains of the one that was under the command of Paladin Latham's group. Ah, so Latham didn't go very far after the wreck. And finally, to the northeast, we discover a junkyard between the compound and the cliffs. Right. I'd like to avoid the entrances if possible. I think we should do a clockwise sweep of the map, clear out everything outside the military compound before trying to find a way in. We appear in some ruins. Directly south of us, we see that the Brotherhood has left us with two crates. In one, we find a remote detonator, some remote detonation traps, and some mines. A huge stack of them. And already, Hawkshorn is encumbered. Oh god, this map is going to be more inventory management hell without the Hummer. In the next crate, we find a stack of six super stim packs and a doctor's bag. I guess this is to foreshadow what is to come. Moving north through these ruins, we don't go very far before we come under fire from mutants in the nearby buildings. Remember the map told us that there were two patrols that routinely navigate the section to the northwest and the northeast, and they change guard in the building in the middle, which is right where we are. We don't move very far before we come under fire. And many of these super mutants are using long-range brownings. I found it difficult to move my guys anywhere without being in range of their devastating big weapons. It seemed like no matter where I moved, one of my characters was getting annihilated. I finally got out of this trap by clearing the gray circle to the northwest first. There are many mutants in this one building. Standing this far to the west, we are out of line of sight from the mutants in the building to the east, so we can pick these off safely from range. With the building clear, we can go inside. I wanted to climb the staircase up to the second floor to set up my snipers, but none of my characters could access the staircase. Against the western wall, we find a crate, and inside the crate, holy cow, 100 rounds of 5.56 millimeter ammunition, 300 rounds of 50 caliber ammunition. A godsend for my big guns characters who are using the Brownings. More 7.62 millimeter ammunition, some meat platters, and three first aid kits. Now these roving super mutant patrols go even this far west, and so I wanted to prepare for them. Putting my big gun characters against the windows, I put my snipers outside and moved them far west. I then used the snipers as lures to bring the roving mutants within range of Alice and Max. Sometimes they didn't take the bait and stayed far away. In these instances, Dylan came in handy. Sometimes they hit against the building wall. In this situation, I had to flush them out with Dylan. And then lure them back to Max and Alice. With the roving bands clear, we can move ever so slightly north to come under fire from mutants guarding the western gate. I kind of wanted to avoid these gates, but they have such good range that there was really nowhere I could go. So instead, I decided to just pick them off. the roving mutants to the west dead, and the mutants guarding the western gate dead, we can move east ever so slightly to come under fire from mutants in the guard changing house and the roving mutants to the east. With 
These clear, we move ever so slightly east to come within range of the mutants guarding the southern gate. Again, Dylan, with his exceptional range, comes to the rescue. By the way, most of these guys are using Brownings. 50 caliber ammunition has been pretty rare up until this point, but now Alice and Max are walking away with more 50 caliber ammunition than they can barely carry. I started the mission with the realization that I wasn't going to be able to take any of the melee weapons or small arms with me, but I was hoping to take a few Brownings back to sell, but no, so much ammunition drops on this map that I had to abandon even 7.62 millimeter ammunition because it was just so ubiquitous and heavy heavy that I couldn't carry all of it and the 50 caliber ammunition that was dropping. At last, we clear the mutants from the southern gate. And now I decided to go back to my plan, to clear outside of the complex going clockwise. So moving northwest, Dylan discovers one more mutant hiding by the western gate. When dead, we can fully heal up, deal with more inventory management, and at last, move north. We pass by a bunch of crumbling pipes, oozing with green fluid. But these don't go anywhere. Eventually, we hit the northern edge of the map, and we can now move east. Hugging the northern edge of the map, we stumble upon the Zeppelin. And standing outside is a man named Rochambeau. Talking with him... Walk my post in a military manner. Oh, hello, children. Uh, I'm sorry. Rochambeau doesn't have any candy for you. Is that a pledge pin on your uniform? If it is, will you help me fly again? My airship has fallen, and it won't get up. Oh, Rochambeau is crazy. Before the Brotherhood, I almost joined the Paladin Order of Peace, or poop, he says. Well, great. Talking to him again. Brothers, brothers, brothers. I didn't expect to see you again, so spoon. You know that I told them that storms would be the end of the air convoy. I told them. But did they listen to me? Heck no. Fool elders exiling their own brothers over nothing. For nothing. Now, scratch my back, son. Like I did for my pappy. Oh, I don't want to know about this guy's pappy. But sounds like this Rochambeau guy was part of Lathan's group that came from the West, still bitter over the Western chapter of the Brotherhood of Steel exiling this Midwestern chapter to the East. I said those airships weren't safe, but did they listen to Rochambeau? I told them that thing would fly like a Led Zeppelin. Then Gamoran tells me about the mime field, so I shouldn't blow my old fool head off. So I said, hey, change your name all you want, you lilac. I still changed your diapers before you were an inch in your daddy's codpiece. Do you have something shiny that you want to trade? All I have is this map of the mime field that Latham gave me. It says there are mimes buried in the field that's north of the east building. <laughs> Gamoran has his faults, but he don't take no crapola from no meddling mimes. Yeah, screw those mimes and their painted faces and berets and things. Doggone mimes. Well, despite talking about a map, he doesn't actually give us one. But really, he doesn't need to. He already told us that the mines were buried in the field north of the fence, as Brotherhood Reconnaissance has already told us. I decided to leave Rochambeau alive in my game. Why murder this crazy old man? But if we kill him on his inventory, we find a bottle of yellow Nuka-Cola. And it is some fans who theorize that Rochambeau himself is the one who gives this bottle of Nuka-Cola its unique flavor and... <clears throat> Color. Of course, that wouldn't explain the bottle of yellow Nuka-Cola that we found in an underground, untouched military complex in an earlier episode, but I digress. Rochambeau has a lot of crazy things to say. You know, son, crapping really becomes a project at my age. This lump on my butt is where the gnomes live. You can hear them if you listen close. Oh, Rochambeau, don't think I'm going to get my ear that close. Children play. Children pray. The New Brotherhood? Pshaw! Well, back in the days... Well, good luck with life, Rochambeau. 
Just north of the ruined zeppelin, we find a crate, and inside, four stim packs. And here we can get the ruins of this zeppelin in its full glory. It looks far too small to be a zeppelin that took an entire army from the west coast all the way here, especially when compared to the scale of one man, but perhaps we can't rely on scale as it's seen in this game. Perhaps we can imagine that it would indeed be large enough. But there we go, that's what the zeppelins look like that carried the Brotherhood all the way to Illinois. Just west of the Zeppelin, we find a second crate with more stim packs, and on the southern tip of the Zeppelin, we find a third crate with even more stim packs. Well, Rochambeau has dutifully warned us about all of the mines that should be in this area as we are approaching the field just north of the gate. So, sending Harold forward, sure enough, he begins to discover mines. And oh, does he discover mines. Mines and mines and more mines. We find a mutant who died to one of these mines, but his corpse is empty. There are so many mines here that I lost count. For a break in the sheer tedium that it was disarming and looting each of these mines, I sent Harold up to explore this ruin. We find a Nuka-Cola fridge and some boxes, but nothing we can interact with. So back to the minefield. We discover and loot more mines, mines, more mines. But then Harold gets some action. This is that break in the northern wall that Brotherhood Reconnaissance told us about. It's probably our best infiltration point, but we'll come back to this after we finish disarming and looting more daggone mines. Everywhere we look, mines, mines, and more mines. I can't take it anymore. Would you just stop with all the mines? Here we find a poor Brahmin lying dead, a victim to all the mines. I think that's it. That's all the daggone stinging mines. Oh no, one more. <laughs> mines. With all the mines finally disarmed and looted, we can explore these ruins to the north. A number of crumbling buildings that were once part of Osceola. Then we recall that Brotherhood Reconnaissance told us about a junkyard at the northeastern corner. Moving inside, we kill a mutant. I navigated this junkyard labyrinth cautiously with Max and Alice to see if there were any more mutants, but there weren't. That was the only one. We find one crate hidden here with buff out, shotgun shells, 7.62 millimeter ammunition, and three first aid kits. And man, did Oxhorn ever make good use of these first aid kits. After exploring the entire junkyard labyrinth, I brought the fellows back to the entrance whereupon they discovered a mutant in a southern building. was hiding next to a trap. Max smacked the living crap out of both the trap and the mutant with his browning, blowing them to kingdom come. Now we can move southeast, but it's here that I saw a tower, and we recall from Brotherhood Reconnaissance that this is their sniper tower. I decided that the best way to take care of this was with a bit of stealth. Putting Babs into stealth and switching her to the Pankar jackhammer, we can have her climb the ladder and... Oh, and she barely escaped with her life. With like one HP left, we can send her bleeding all the way down the ladder and limping back to Oxhorn, who can heal her up. The mutants on the watchtower are dead. But while she was busy killing them, she came under fire from mutants inside the military compound. But if they can shoot out, we can shoot in. This gave me the bright idea of placing Dylan on top of the watchtower. And sure enough, he began to fire inside the compound. I decided, well, why not get all of my ghoul snipers up there? I tried to bring up Harold, but the mutants inside the military compound kept firing upon him. <laughs> when he gets knocked off the ladder, he slides all the way down and hits the ground. Ouch. I guess I'm glad fall damage isn't a thing in this game. I then tried the same with Babs. Ooh, she got splattered. So I waited until the mutants inside the compound ran up flush against the eastern wall. Then I sent up all three of my ghoul snipers. Yeah. 
I left the three of them up here to take pot shots on the mutants whenever they reared their ugly heads. This proved to be highly effective at getting rid of the melee mutants. I figured I'll just let the ghouls do their thing while we explore the rest of the map with the rest of the squad. Grabbing Alice, Max, and Oxhorn, whom I equipped with the FNFAL and the laser pistol, we can move east. We find a body here, but as soon as we get close, we discover, God, no, more stinking traps. So bring in Harold down from the watchtower. We can have him join the rest of the crew. And at this point, I said, screw it. I'm not looting any more of these doggone mines. I already had two characters whose inventory was full with all of the mines we looted earlier. And so I had Harold just disarm each and every one of these doggone blasted mines. But soon I discovered a flaw in this strategy. By not looting the mines, I quickly lost track of which ones were disarmed and which ones were simply discovered. But here you can see the sheer breadth of this minefield, and this one was smaller than the one we looted earlier. That's a lot of mines. Well, I think I disarmed all of them. Grabbing the squad, we can skirt around the minefield and move to the east. But this brings us to the eastern wall, so we can move south. But this brings us to a desert. Here we find a lot of cacti. Does cacti typically grow in Missouri? Soon we reach the southern edge of the map. This forces us back west. And here we find a mutant. Guarding a staircase leading below. But he's not alone. Creeping closer. We kill two more. After looting the 50 caliber ammunition on these bodies, we can finish exploring to the west. We find a ruined shop to the south, but it's completely empty. And at last we arrive back at the building where the mutants did the changing of the guard. So bringing the team back to that staircase, we can head downstairs to see what's here. I sent Alice down, and sure enough, she discovers a tunnel leading deeper into the compound. But to traverse this tunnel, we have to wade knee-deep through toxic, irradiated sludge. I just didn't want to bother with the radiation, so I figured we'd just walk through the main gates. Thinking that the southern and western gates were more or less clear, I brought the squad to the southern gate. Here we can loot the dead and then step through. We find ruined cars and trucks and machinery littering the ground. But we don't move very far until we find that the super mutants are hunkered down behind sandbag barricades on an elevated platform surrounded by fuel tanks in the middle of the compound. In particular, there were a bunch of mutants on a platform to the northwest. There was no staircase leading up behind it. The only way to get there was to go through their barrage of fire. I didn't want to do that. So instead, leaving out the western gate, we can circle back around to that break in the wall to the north. But it's here I discovered that Harold missed a few mines, and all of these mines are lining the northern gate. So we can disable even more of these stinking mines. Now I had my ghoul snipers on the watchtower. I figured that would give me enough cover. I could flesh out the mutants inside the compound with just this squad. So heading in through the gate and moving to the northeastern corner, we see that we have to go around this large elevated platform to find a way up. But trying to move around it, Oh, we come under fire from a mutant lying prone against the eastern wall and a mutant hiding amongst fuel tanks on the platform. Apparently he was out of range of my snipers and the guy on the ground had a browning. He was just tearing up my guys. So reloading a save, we can move the squad back to the same position and if we detonate these tanks on the upper platform, one of the mutants hunkered down behind a sandbag barricade. That leaves one on the catwalk and one lying prone against the wall. I figured if I bring Max and Alice in with their brownings, they have the same range, right? Oh no, they couldn't get close enough without taking serious damage. I then tried to take down Harold so that I could leave Dylan on top of the tower. Harold had a sniper rifle as well. His perception wasn't quite as high, but surely I could pick this guy off, right? I crept closer and closer to try and get that hit percentage up just enough to do some real damage. But just about when Harold could hit him, 
he began to take serious damage from the mutant. So at last I resigned myself to taking Babs and Dylan from the watchtower and having them rejoin the squad. Then without much help, I decided to try Dylan with his 12 perception. Maybe he would be able to reach this mutant. And before even getting him very close at all, he begins to take pot shots at this mutant and hitting the guy. This is such an excellent example of how important perception is for a sniper. I couldn't get any solid hits with Harold after closing half the distance, but here Dylan is, almost off screen, absolutely devastating this guy, who can't even hit him with his browning. So I just parked Dylan here to whittle him away. But that leaves the one mutant on the catwalk. This fence is blocking my way for Dylan. I couldn't get far enough away. And so I figured, well, let's see if we can surprise him. And Alice did just that. But moving down to loot, we find another mutant. Jack, these guys are just everywhere. And even this wasn't enough range to make use of Dylan. But I figured if I was sneaky, I could use Alice. Crouching her down, she can sneak south along this wall, then sneak west. We know this mutant is hiding behind these sandbag barricades. If she can remain undetected long enough to get up behind him. Bingo. This makes the eastern and southern edges of the military complex clear. And we can now move about a bit more safely. I sent Dylan to loot the dead. He was one of the few people I had left who could carry anything. And here we discover the first of two staircases we read about that lead to the complex below. Sending Dylan down, his excellent perception picked up a mutant crouched down in this room. Hovering over him, we discover that we can engage in dialogue with him, which means he's not going to be hostile. Good to know. We'll save that for later. Moving Dylan around, there are no more mutants over here, though we do discover a ladder leading down into a pit filled with a large tank. Heading down, we see that we're at the end of that tunnel that Alice discovered earlier. So had we taken the tunnel, we would have popped up right here in the middle of the complex under fire from the mutants behind those sandbag barricades. Well, I'm glad we didn't come this way. It was time to take out those mutants on the platform far to the northwest. And with Dylan's amazing range, we didn't have to get very close. With the mutants still off screen, Dylan lands his hits. But this scared a couple of the mutants off. They left the platform and moved deeper in. I didn't want Dylan to get surprised, so sending him on top of this upper platform where we can have him hunker down behind some sandbag barricades, and then moving Alice to the other side of these fuel tanks, we can set up an ambush in case any of those mutants decide to charge us. Bringing Dylan up to take some shots. Sure enough, a few rush forward and try to get closer. This guy decided he didn't want to walk into our trap. He couldn't hit Dylan because Dylan was hiding, but he wasn't going to walk any closer. So grabbing Alice, we can move her around the fuel tanks. And knowing that her browning has pretty good range, if we can come up beside him so that he can't see us... Bingo! Racing Alice all the way back around the fuel tanks. We can hide from the other mutant who came to his friend's defense. He raced to the spot where Alice had killed the mutant, but then he stopped, unsure of where to go next but he's still close enough for Alice to land a hit. So, racing her forward, she took damage, but she killed him. And his buddy. With that, we've cleared all of the mutants outside this building erected on the top of this platform. Bringing the squad together, we can now try to scout this building. Getting Alice close enough, her perception detects at least two mutants inside. But there are no windows on any of the walls. There's no back door. There is only one entrance, a door in the western wall. I first tried to have the brother and sister big gun duo overwhelm them. But I didn't realize until it was too late that Max was blinded. At some point, he got blinded during the fight, bringing his perception down to one and the mutants inside tore them to pieces. I then tried to set up an ambush outside the door with Alice and Max. I wanted to lure them out with Harold's thrown explosives. There wasn't a lot of room to work with, but I hoped that maybe Harold could toss one grenade. He 
got the grenade in, but it didn't lure them out, and he was still too close. They devastated him with their brownings. This is an awkward place. If this were on level ground, I could send Dylan far out in front of the door to lure them out, but it's on an elevated platform. The ground beneath the platform is out of line of sight, but then I looked at that platform to the west where we killed those mutants. The far edge of that platform is just within line of sight of the main door where one of the mutants is standing. If I position Dylan at just the right spot on this platform, maybe he can reach them. And sure enough, one down, one to go. I tried standing Dylan on every corner of this platform, but he still couldn't reach that final mutant in the middle of the shack. But as I moved Dylan around, I realized that the mutant was keenly aware of Dylan's presence. He kept on facing to wherever Dylan stood. I figured, well, if he's going to do that, then maybe I can maneuver him so that his back is facing the door. And if his back is facing the door, when Alice and Max race in, maybe they can get a jump on him. Positioning Dylan to the back of the building, we can try it. Well, he did face the door just before the duo raced in, but as there was only one of them, Alice took a little damage, but he's dead, and we survived. Inside this shack is one bookshelf, and in the bookshelf, 150, 50 caliber rounds, two field medic first aid kits, and some donuts. With that, the service is clear. We now need to go underground to find Gamoran. Taking the squad to the western staircase, we can send Dylan down to reconnoiter the area. He arrives in a room filled with boxes. Creeping closer, his perception picks up a couple of mutants in what appears to be a canteen. They all appear to be hostile. I figured it would be better to talk with the non-hostile mutant in the other room first. And so, bringing Dylan back topside, we can move the squad to the eastern staircase. It was hard for them to maneuver, so bringing them down one by one, we can start with Babs. Oh, and the door opens up automatically. Sure enough, this mutant is not hostile, and we can send her into the room. Then bringing the rest of the squad down one by one, because they just didn't want to come down as a squad, they all enter the room. Our perception picks up a mutant hunkered down behind some boxes just on the other side of this western gate. Looks like a trap is in store for us, but at least now we're aware of it. Talking to the mutant in this room, we see that he has some running commentary. We were ambushed. The robots now have General Barnaby. No good. I'm finished. Good morn. Good morn. Is that you? I failed you, my lord. <coughs> we all failed you. Whole platoon wiped out by that one monster. They crushed us. Most things, they don't feel pain. <coughs> I used to think the same thing once. They took my prisoner, General Barnaby. I didn't have time. Get any information from him. He's a tough nut to crack, all right. <coughs> don't like mutants much either. You should have seen it, Gamorn. It looks like an angry god. Breathes fire and death. <clears throat> My death. I'm going to die. I don't hurt anymore. Why is it so bright? I hope it's not that damn robot again. Master. And with that, Tokamata dies. So the mutants here had just defended themselves from an attack. No wonder they were all hunkered down. They were attacked by what, though? A monster that looked like an angry god? It breathed fire and death. And did he say, robot? There is something out there that the Brotherhood is not aware of yet. And that something now has General Barnaby. I suppose we can breathe a sigh of relief that General Barnaby is a stubborn old man. Despite the Brotherhood's fears that he would have revealed some sensitive Brotherhood information, apparently he didn't. No amount of interrogation or torture by these mutants could make Parnicky talk. His final word was, Master. Could he be referring to the Master? 
Is he and the other super mutants here part of the master's army? If so, why do they look so different? They have hair. Every single one we've met so far has been intelligent and eloquent. If these mutants really are remnants of the master's army, why are they so different from the mutants we met on the west coast? And of course the ones on the east coast. But that's a topic for another day. On Takamata's body is an impact glove and a holotape. Barnaki's letters. Inspecting the holotape in our inventory, we learn that it's a letter from General Barnaki to his wife, Maria. This is the first holotape I've come across in the game. I did everything I could to try and read it, the same way we read holotapes in Fallout 1 and Fallout 2, but we just can't download any information from this holotape. All we get is the item's description. In this room, we find one shelf against the eastern wall. And inside, another field medic first aid kit and three more first aid kits. At this point, Oxhorn's gonna walk away with more first aid than he arrived with. Now, instead of going through the western door where we know the mutants have a trap for us, I wanted to try and find a way in behind them. And so I decided to move north. We see two mutants waiting for us standing amongst a bunch of propane tanks. I had the bright idea of using Oxhorn with his pistol to try and open the door quickly and detonate the tanks. Oh, uh, well, it, it, it worked. A, a bit too well, really. Let's try that again, but uh, maybe without standing so close. I had Bab stand in front of the doorway with her sniper rifle. I was hoping to manually target one of the propane tanks, but after the door opened, for some reason, I just couldn't select one of the tanks manually. She couldn't get a shot off. So instead, I had Harold step forward with a grenade. That worked. Mutant Zero, Harold Two. And it only cost one grenade. Moving into the room, we find a number of containers, but we can't loot any of them. Then we see a doorway leading to a stock room to the west. Creeping through it, lots of boxes and jars, but nothing we can loot or interact with. This opens out into a large storage room to the west. Again, more shelves and containers, a few bunk beds, only one of which we can access, a bookshelf against the northern wall. Inside, yet another field medic first aid kit, three super stim packs, and 120 more 50 caliber rounds. We find a door in this room to the west, but peering through it, we see that room filled with boxes that Dylan found when he went down the western staircase, and there's no door leading to the canteen. Oh no, that means there's only one way inside, and that's through the gate that we know is guarded by that mutant behind the boxes. Well, there's no way around it. We've got to go through this door. I really wanted to find a use for this flamer pistol that Oxhorn got a few missions ago. So arming Oxhorn and sending him in. Ooh, he got a couple of shots off, but then he got fried to a crisp. What, did his flamer pistol backfire on him? I was determined though, so trying again. Got him! Racing back into the room. We can lure the other mutants into an ambush. Two down, but there's one more mutant behind the bar. Time for the brother-sister duo. Uh, where, is he hiding? Where are you? Hello? Ah. Oh God, that was messy. But at least he's dead. After healing up, we can loot up. I went behind the counter, but we can't interact with any of these bookshelves. Then, putting our ear against the northern wall, we hear one mutant hiding behind some boxes to the west but I think there are probably more inside. Moving Harold to loot the body of the guy hiding behind the boxes, we discover a flamer. That's how Oxhorn got singed. It wasn't his pistol backfiring on him. This guy was gonna fry people with a flamer. Ouch. Now, before we pass through this final door, I need to push pause. I discovered while browsing the game files that initially the developers intended us to find holotape journals belonging to Paladin Latham scattered around this military complex. 
piecing the story together would have given us some context as to what Latham did just after his Zeppelin crashed and why he made the choices that he did. But the developers, for unknown reasons, cut all of them from the game. And so before we move forward, I'm going to play all of the journals for you here. Here is Paladin Latham in the first journal. Journal of Sir Latham, entry 10.1.4. We have crash-landed north of a camp occupied by super-mutants. We believe these to be the remnants of the Master's army as encountered by the first Vault Dweller. Although the archives mentioned that some of these super-mutants might actually be friendly, we found little to like about these ones, especially the Chief. The leader of this camp went by the name of Gamoran. We were set upon by his patrols. Soon after we pulled ourselves from the wreckage, bound and gagged, the mutant guards dragged us back to their camp. Fully half of us had been killed by the crash, and now less than half of that survived the treatment of our mutant captors. We were scheduled to be killed for the amusement of Gmorin. It was not hard to see that several of the super mutants were unhappy with this. In fact, I was amazed to discover that they were not a savage, as I had previously been led to believe. I challenged Gamoran to single, unarmed combat. It was to the death. There could be no other outcome in my mind. If I die, it will be in combat. In the next one. Journal of Sir Latham, entry 0.0.1. I am awake. To tell the truth, I remember little of the battle. The gash on my head, along with multiple fractures and breaks, paint an adequate picture. However, the mutants are now expecting me to lead them, since I laid Gamoran to rest. I will record more later. I fear my brain has been set awry by the fight. I will try to rest until I can think clearly. In the next one... Journal of Sir Latham, entry 0.5.8. The super mutants are a simple but good people. While considered stupid by many, they show a loyalty stronger than I've seen in many humans. They live life the only way they know how. I've begun to organize these mutant forces with a handful of fellow humans who survived the crash. I have recovered physically, but I find myself prone to mysterious fits of anger and depression. But much worse are the hallucinations. In the next one. Journal of Sir Latham. Entry 1.4.5. Today is a day filled with absolute horror. Only one mutant returned from a scouting trip that was ten soldiers strong. He staggered back to camp and collapsed without a sound. He died in my arms while trying to hold back the blood pouring from his mouth. Before I had a chance to close his eyes, the menace was upon us. Metallic death machines entered the camp undetected by my sentries. I've never seen creatures such as this before, but they seemed unstoppable. It was only the sheer power, and more importantly, our numbers, that allowed us to defeat these three machinations of death. Our losses were staggering. In the next one... Journal of Sir Latham... Entry 1.8.2 We are resting now. Humans and mutants alike hanging their heads and trying to catch their breath. Who knows how far we've retreated? Twenty miles? Forty even? Once we put enough distance between us and this... this menace from the west, then we can regroup and plan a counterstrike. In the next one... Journal of Sir Latham, Entry 2.3.4 I am not well. This morning, I thought I was attacked by a death claw. Too far from my SMG, I lashed out with my ripper, slashing the beast's throat. My vision cleared in time to see Nathan the Scribe's eyes go cloudy, his neck in ruin, his blood covering my hands. How can I go mad when humanity is in such dire peril? I must maintain my sanity. I must. And in the final one... Journal of Sir Latham, Entry 2.4.2 My scouts engaged an enemy today. The sound of chain guns and explosions hasting my steps. What I observed in that fight changed me to the core of my being. 
my mutant scouts were engaged by a Brotherhood patrol. For the first time in my life, I was frozen in battle. I watched, curious even, tribal-looking Brotherhood soldiers laughing maniacally as they cut down my new companions. My mutant companions who dedicated their life to me as their leader. I lifted my weapon then, and I fired again and again. And when it was over, with Brotherhood corpses littering the ground, my head suddenly cleared. I now know my purpose, and more importantly, I finally know who I am. I am Gamoran, sworn enemy of the menace from the West. From this cut content, we learn why these mutants were initially hostile when we met them. They had previously met Brotherhood patrols that fired upon them on sight. Latham became an enemy of the Brotherhood in defense of his new people. But surely he shouldn't have been surprised by the fight between that Brotherhood patrol and his mutants. After all, he was kidnapped by mutants and half of the survivors from his zeppelin were slain by them. But it seems that we're not his ultimate enemy. He encountered something much more monstrous, something bigger and more powerful than we have yet seen in this wasteland. This menace from the West is his true enemy. He was focusing on defeating them before we arrived. Well, to see what's hiding behind this door, I decided we would first try just barging in with missile launchers. That never fails, right? Welcome, brothers. Welcome. What a fine bunch of soldiers I see before me. If only the West Coast elders could see you, they would finally agree with us about sharing the Brotherhood's wealth of education and technology. But I digress. Do you believe you can stop the menace from the West? Your eyes give you away, brother. They tell me you don't even understand who or what the menace is. The elders have always been blind to what is not in front of them, but it ends here. The general is not here for you to save, I'm afraid, and you cannot save me or yourself. Now, show me what you've learned. Go! You know, and maybe if my missiles didn't miss all the time, I would have actually killed them before dying horribly. But there it is again, a menace to the West. And now we understand why Latham, now called Gamoran, is working with the mutants. He thought that the Brotherhood wasn't up to the task. That the only way to defeat this menace to the West was to work with the super mutants. I wonder, though, why he wouldn't work alongside the Midwestern chapter. Clearly, he was at odds with the Western Brotherhood. He wanted the Brotherhood to share technology, open their ranks to non-human members, which is exactly what the Midwestern chapter of the Brotherhood is doing. He almost sounded proud of us, and yet he still chose to work with the mutants. I wonder why. Well, we're going to try this again. Opening the door, we can try to lure the mutants out using Dylan's sniper fire. And there we go. Babs got hurt a little bit, but melee mutant dead. Mutant behind the box is dead. All that's left is Latham. I tried sending Harold in with explosives. But splat? So let's just race in with big guns. You've completed the objectives for this mission. Proceed to the exit grid to leave this mission. And thus ends Latham. Initially, we were supposed to have the option to spare Latham's life. For within the files of the game, I found a plea from Paladin Latham for his own life. I did not sacrifice my very identity to be beaten by those I strive to save. Ask yourself what you will gain by killing me. Judge me not by my actions, but by my goals. This undead enemy will not stop until all life has been extinguished. Why can't you see that? Why? 
and yet this option was cut from the game. Our only choice is to kill him. On his body was a Tommy gun and six stim packs. So Latham wasn't a super mutant. He was never infected with FEV. He stayed a human and somehow the mutants followed him. This leaves us with so many questions. I wonder if they'll ever be answered. At the foot of Latham's bed is a chest and inside we find a briefcase and three super stim packs. Inspecting the briefcase in our inventory, we learn no description. Oh, great job there guys. It's not like I wanted answers or anything. Like the holotape, we can't download any information from it or use it. So we just gotta take this back to the Brotherhood and hope that they can make sense of it. With that, we've cleared Osceola and we killed the leader of the super mutants. Heading back topside, we can make for the extraction point and share with the Brotherhood some good news and some bad news. Excellent work, warrior. Today is a day of joy and sorrow for the Brotherhood. Gamoran was a traitor, a murderer, and a deceiver, yet he was a paladin. His brave deeds once brought much hope to the wasteland. Yet something happened to him when the great storm ripped his airship from the convoy and crashed it to the ground. From that moment, Gamoran was born and the Brotherhood lost its favorite son. With their leader dead, the mutants have split into factions. Some have turned to internal fighting as they wrestle for control. Others have even offered to join the Brotherhood. Though the mutant menace is far from ended, they are severely weakened. It will be some time before they gather their strength. Dagger Squad is out on patrol now, hunting any mutant stragglers. The briefcase you retrieved from Gamoran's quarters has turned out to be an invaluable find. It is a portable nuclear arming station from the time before the Great War, and, according to our scribes, it can be retrofitted to our nuclear warhead. While some of General Barnaki's possessions have been recovered from the mutant base, his location continues to be a mystery. We can only pray for his well-being while we continue the search for answers. Rest assured that our interrogators are working round the clock with the mutant prisoners. Time will tell. We have a service for Paladin Latham tonight at the motor pool at 2200. Dismissed. Initially, finding Paladin Latham's scattered journals would have been an optional part of this quest. We couldn't collect them because they were cut from the game, so we couldn't complete this part of the quest. But had we done so, General Decker would have said this. As one of the original Air Convoy crew, I would like to express my thanks for recovering Paladin Latham's Halidisk journal. It contains valuable information, and our scribes are matching the events recounted within to our known history. There are many unanswered questions that now can be put to rest. Now we've got a nuclear warhead and a means by which to detonate it. But hopefully it won't come to that. I mean, the Brotherhood is all about not repeating the sins of our fathers. The last thing we need is another nuclear apocalypse. Sounds like we'll never get to know what was on General Barnaby's last message to his wife. But then again, it was a private letter for a family member. So I suppose this is the way it should be. However, the developers initially intended us to be able to listen to his holotape, for they recorded General Barnaby's last message to his wife, which I found in the game files. So at the risk of invading his privacy, here it is. My dearest Maria, although it pains me to record this, I must continue. Time is short and my future is less than certain. I'm currently captured and held prisoner by a large group of super mutants, and I don't believe that I'm going to make it back this time. But once again, time is short, and I'll use it to tell you what is important. I love you, Maria. I've loved you since we first met, and I love you even more 50 years since. We were always much alike, you and I and know that I would never have had the courage to fight for humanity without you faithfully by my side. For in the end, I realize I did it all for you. For I wanted nothing more but to restore order to this chaotic world so you can live a life free of danger, free of fear, free of ungodly mutations. I'm afraid I'm out of time. I'll make every attempt to fix this world for you, my love. I promise. Love eternal. Simon Barnaby. 
Packing up our things, we can hop back in the Hummer and make our way back to Bunker Gamma. We never do find a service for Paladin Latham at the motor pool of Bunker Gamma, but at least now that we're back home, we can rest up, heal up, and prepare ourselves for our next mission, and prepare ourselves to discover more about this monster to the west. We'll pick up right here where we leave off in my next episode. I publish new Fallout videos each and every week on my channel, so if you don't want to miss the next episode, be sure to subscribe and to click that bell notification button. I have a shirt shop with completely unique designs that you can't find anywhere else. My designs come on shirts in a variety of men's, women's, and children's sizes, and in a wide array of colors. You can find them on other products as well, like smartphone cases, pillows, posters, mugs, stickers, prints, etc. So if interested, you can find a link to my shop in the description below, or you can click here. If you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming a patron on Patreon or a member here on YouTube. YouTube members and patrons on Patreon gain access to a private channel on my Discord server. And YouTube members get little badges next to their names in the comment sections of my videos and access to ox emojis that they can use during the live chats of my live streams. But more than anything, I'm just so glad you're here watching this video with me today. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you soon with more brand new videos.